Hey guys, welcome to an episode of In Range. We have a very special guest. Hey. Hey, Robert Evans, which most of you know from Behind the Bastards, but also author, war correspondent, and all sorts of other things. Yeah, I've done a couple of couple of stuff. A whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. And you're here, not uh, over the internet, but actually in real space, meek space, to do this in person. Yeah, I wanted to show you my Bart Simpson commemorative Desert Storm t-shirt. Uh, and it's but, but obviously you can't take pictures of these. They don't show up on uh, on cameras. Right. Yeah. So it's not going to be in the video either. It's not going to be in the video. I can see it because I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. That's a shame. We'll have to like give some people some sort of like mm-hmm. artistic rendering or something. Yeah, I'll do a doodle. A doodle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe some bit- bitmaps. So I got a collection of questions that are both guns and like let's say, historical, sociological stuff, and I figured we'd bounce back and forth. Sure. Sound fair? Yeah. yeah. Let's start, and I'm just going to go back and forth. Let's see here. We'll just start with a simple one, which kind of applies to both of us, from Tim B., for both of you and I. Okay. What led you all to produce content, whether it's in range or behind the bastards or something else? So, oh. like, why don't you start with that one? I mean, you know, uh, that's such a bit because I've done so many different types, and I guess different things kind of moved me into different realms. Like, I've always been intrigued by journalism. When I was a kid, I came across a copy of Transmetropolitan, which had a big impact on me, and then I read Thompson's Head, Hell's Angels, which had, which mm. had a big impact on me. Um, but also there was, like, kind of crude self-interest in that I didn't want to work at a job where I had to, like, wake up at a certain hour, and sure. I didn't want to have to leave my house. And at that point in time, there was a bunch of internet journalism jobs, and so all of those things kind of came together. Because the first stuff I was doing was like tech industry journalism, right? Which is barely journalism on its best days. You, there are some people who do good tech industry journalism. It's mostly hype train. But yeah, a lot of it is hype train, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and so that was that was a different motivation than what got me into actual journalism, which kind of was comedy, weirdly enough. Because I the thing I had always wanted to do since I was a kid, I'd been reading all these comedians on the internet, uh, John Cheese, who's now disgraced, and Jason Pargin, who was not, and um, Jay Pinkerton, who went on to work for Valve and made, like, Portal games mm-hmm. and stuff. Portal's uh, great. And uh, Sean Baby, obviously, and, and, you know, some older, uh, weirder chunks of, of internet content creators. So I had always, as a 11, 12-year-old, was in love with all of this kind of stuff, and thought it would be really cool to like, make a living doing that. And um, so I had... To, wanted to work for Crack, which is where Jason, um, who was the person I enjoyed the most and one of my favorite authors, started working as an editor. And I kind of, while I was pursuing any kind of writing job that would pay, which is what got me into journalism, I was also working unpaid for Crack, which eventually turned into a job. And then I was able to like basically sell them on doing the kind of journalism that I had grown interested in doing, which was you know, heavily based around finding people who were living interesting lives and just like putting together articles about these weird little facets of the human experience. We talked to, like, a guy who makes swords for a living about, like, yeah. these are the things that movies get wrong about swords. These are, like, the weird realities of being a blacksmith. Like, you set off metal alarm, or, or, or metal detectors <laughs> for the rest of your life. Is there so many fragments? Yeah, exactly. Oh, like, wow, fragments, fascinating. Like, just embedded yeah. in your skin and shit. And, like, yeah, cool stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, and then... You know, the stuff that the journalism that actually got me, because that was all that was successful, it got a lot of people read it, but it was not particularly like noteworthy to journalists or particularly respected within most of the journalism space. It was when I started obsessing over like weird terrorist groups and how they use the internet, which was purely from a point of just like interest. Like, yeah. I, I came across all of this weird ISIS propaganda that didn't look like any terrorist group propaganda I'd ever seen. Some of it was quite good. It's very, very, yeah. very well put together. Yeah, yeah, good yeah. graphic design. Um, and they even, did, they did, they had some columnists who were quite good writers, including John Canton, who was a captured Western journalist who is probably buried somewhere in Syria. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it was, uh, I, I just, like, got fascinated in that. And then when shit took a turn in 2016, um... I started getting increasingly interested in Nazis and in modern Nazis. And it was, you know, Charlottesville, I had been following for a while. I had pitched uh, a person at Scripps who owned Cracked at the time on going there. I was like, I think this is going to be, a, like, this Unite the Right thing, I think is going to be really fucking gnarly. Um, and then it was. And, you know, I, I, after that, was committed to not missing the next thing, which is part of what brought me to Portland. Yep. And then 2020 happened. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that's a long answer to that. No, that's a, that's a that's a that's an interesting answer. One of the things that is 
in common there was at least a beginning of interest in tech mm -hmm. and Hunter Thompson, who I consider yeah. very much an inspiration of some of his work. He's a great writer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So in that regard, and his approach to just sociological issues, right? Like, yeah. he was a definitely pro-gun guy, but was not, would not consider, I don't think he's not around anymore, but he definitely would not have considered him part of what a lot of the gun community considers itself now. No, I, he would have been baffled yes, by a lot of them. I think so, yeah. I mean, the thing that he came back to, and like, I've read his son's book, too, and, and friends of him will say, is like, the number one thing he liked about guns was like the noise and the way it felt. Yeah. He was also a hunter, too. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, so there was this number one, he, there was a period of time where he was very poor and he kept his family fed in part by hunting. And then as a recreational shooter, it's, his son writes about this a lot. It was one of the things, because they were very different people and they had a strange relationship. It was one of the things that they bonded over is that they both appreciated shooting and Hunter appreciated that his son was a good shot and was good at, when Hunter was in less good health, his son would clean all of his guns for him. And Hunter would like sit there when they would like watch football and, and talk with his son clean the guns. And in fact, one of the more confusing parts of Juan's book, just in terms of getting into Juan's headspace, is that um, the day or two before Hunter killed himself, Juan cleaned the forty five that he used. Oh. And Juan, yeah. Juan was like, no, Juan didn't, yeah. does, like, felt good about that. In the book, he's like, he used a clean gun? Well, it's just, just more that, like, this <laughs> was, right, no. he, he yeah. was going to do this. Yes. Like, this is not something that could have been I don't think Hunter was this. ever mis holding that as a mystery. No. He no. always said that he would exit on yeah. his own terms. Yeah. 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 And he was like, no, this was something that connected us, and now I have all of his guns, and I, you know, I, I go shooting with my kids, and like, this is a thing. Yeah. This was one of the few areas where we were, like, on the same wavelength, and could, like, both kind of meet his equals yeah. after a very fraught relationship that they'd had it was a thing that they were able to bond over he writes about it well in his book uh, Stories I Tell Myself an interesting, an interesting read an interesting point that. in the microcosm to the macrocosm that firearms and the shooting sports while there are tools of self-defense etc it can also be a community tool as yep. well it can bond yeah yeah. so for in range um, I was doing information security full time and then landed up I think I've told this story before actually but I was Googling an esoteric firearm on the internet, and this was during the embryonic time of Forgotten Weapons, before Forgotten Weapons was big. It was small, it was a little tiny thing. And I saw Ian struggling to uh, use a reproduction uh, SMG guns FG-42 at a, at a three-gun match up in Phoenix. And their rules at that range were like yeah. horrible. You just couldn't do anything cool with the guns. And so I emailed them out of the blue. I'm like, why don't you come to my two-gun match? Because back then I was already running two-gun because I was into shooting, and I said, why don't you come down to this thing and shoot a match that doesn't suck? It was literally that. And then he showed up. Oh, my, hey, this guy actually showed up. And then while we were doing this, we started naturally, like, doing videos together about the verses where we were shooting different old guns against each other, and then that kind of turned into, this could be an entirely different channel of content that's nothing like anything else. Like, it could be competitive, but with old guns, but also include sociological elements, which was more on my side, frankly. Yeah. And that's kind of how in range happened. Yeah. And then we did that together for years, and then he landed up having to be too busy with Forgotten Weapons and his book projects, which, if you look, they're prolific. Yeah. Um, and so in range became wholly mine, and I've been slowly like doing it as my thing, along with guests, such as yourself or someone else, which is cool. Yeah. yeah. I, I think like the commonality that is also because people often who ask very variants of this question are doing it because like they want to make stuff. That's true. And like I think the thing that is. Um, kind of worth taking out of like both stories from that standpoint is that what will probably be successful as content is the thing that you're drawn to by obsession anyway yeah, like it's it's point. not the stuff the stuff that I, I've done in my career because I needed a paycheck is not the stuff I I don't remember it most days right it's the stuff that like I felt compelled to make out of obsession yep. like that's the thing that is going to actually make an impact on people like it, it's not if you're trying to follow trends, you can make a living following trends. No, of but course. You can't make yeah. anything anyone's going to remember following trends. You make things that like impact people by becoming a weird little guy about it. Um, and <laughs> there's always going to be people who want to be weird little guys about the thing you want to be a weird little guy about. And yeah, that's yeah. yeah. And that's and, and yeah. so as a result, the channel has evolved a little bit because when Ian was more a part of it, it was definitely more mechanically influenced in terms of like how the guns function and the history of the firearm yeah. itself. And my interest was always kind of more on the sociological side about why were the firearms designed the way they are and how were they used in the human series of events. Mm -hmm. And so with him not around as much, it's kind of, yeah, the channel's kind of focused a little bit differently, which is more on the historicity and the, and the use of these weapons in human events. 
that's always the thing that interests yeah. me most just about they say the way different cultures, different individuals, different countries make weapons and the weapons they choose says so much about them. Like, I, the, I think the first time I really noticed this was just as I started shooting, the first gun I ever owned was an infield. Yeah. The second one was a was a, a Mosin Nagant. Um, a couple of different. I bought a lot of four of them. Three normal length ones, one carbine, and then a Nagant revolver for 200 bucks from a guy. It wasn't long ago that Nagants were easy to buy, buy like, like cordwood. The thing that... Yeah. Uh, well, I will never not feel sore about is there was a time when I could have gotten it was fucking cheaper than dirt. Their physical store yeah. in Texas had crates of 10 SKSs for $1,000. <laughs> just like, God damn it. <laughs> Care to go along with those, isn't it? No, yeah. But you're right. It does speak to like cultural things. Even the design itself The does. design itself, the peculiarities of the weapons, the Mosin is a fucking pain in the ass. <laughs> you could like, you have to Oh, damn near have to have a hammer to make that thing function properly. And I don't think they worked much better back in the day. Um, I'm not as familiar with the car, but, like, the infield is this, you know, as a bolt, as bolt-action as rifles from the era go, a, a, a very smooth and, and, like... It's kind of a race car. Yeah, it's a yeah. race car. T- and then the Garand is this terrifying death spinning machine. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, you, you could see a lot about, like, the countries from, like what wound up being kind of like the main arm they had. And it definitely, it's, the, the Garand in some ways like embodies the United States more than any other weapon had, just because of how it contrasts to what everyone else was giving. Yeah, no, it did. Time. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Speaking of that, well, funny, now you say that, we'll go to one of the gun questions. Noah S. Online I see a full disdain or great love for the Garand style rifle. Why do you think this is, and where do you each fall on this seemingly two-point spectrum? I'll go with it first. Yeah. I think the GAM-1 is still a fantastic rifle. Yeah. Now, is it a little bit obsolescent because it's an A-rack capacity? Sure. Sure. Is the sighting system, you know, dated with iron sights? Absolutely. Was it fundamentally, like, the most effective semi-automatic weapon of World War II? Easily. Yeah. And is it still effective today? Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's a fantastic gun. Yeah, I think we were talking about this the other night, but if you're in one of the states that heavily restricts what kind of rifle, mm-hmm. it, there's basically nowhere that you can own a rifle that you cannot own a Garand. Yeah. And from a, any kind of practical perspective, from hunting to fears of civil collapse, it is a, a an effect it will be an effective tool in, in most people's hands. Like you can do far worse. Yeah. Uh, eight rounds of thirty out six is not nothing. And those M block clips, if yeah. once you get used to it, yeah. that gun reloads fast. Yeah. In fact, I've never done this and I want to eventually. I will argue that the M one is reloadable faster over a duration of time than the M fourteen with the box magazine. Yeah, that would be that box sense. mag is a it's bitch a to get in ass. there. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. No, I, I can't imagine having obviously it is an antique, you know, it's an old rifle. There's things about it, like you said, the sights that are not... But also, if you're not precious about the historic, the, the historic nature of it, I, I've seen people affix yeah. modern optics to a Garrett. It's not an impossible thing. And there's... You probably get a repro or something if you don't want to fuck with this. We were talking about yeah. the three-gun guy that used yeah. the red dot. This guy did well in a three-gun. And he got placed third or yeah, something. Yeah, red dot on a Garrett. And was reloading at such a rate that, like, I don't think most people with a... I don't think most average shooters with a semi-automatic rifle could outshoot that guy. Yep. Right? And obviously he put a lot of work into getting yeah. that good. And a lot of money in 30 out 6 but... <laughs> no, I can't imagine having an issue with the Garrett. It's high up on my list of weapons to purchase. I think we both fall on the same thing. It's awesome. Mm-hmm. Well, this one I found, I saw this one, and I'm really curious what you think, because I already have my answer, but you're kind of getting surprised by the question. Owen, how do we get more progressives... Put that in quotes. Into firearms culture and spaces. I think I'll, there's a couple of different things I think about this because a lot of my shooting um, it has been with people who are not shooters. I did, especially when I lived back in Texas. It became I did it often on dates because, like, just I would be you know chatting with somebody. I'd have like a first date with them, and I would mention the fact that I was shooting, and that would very often be she would very often say something like, "Oh, I've never been." Yep. Um, and then I'd be like, well... Like, you want to? Want to go to a remote location on our first date and shoot guns? Well, no, it was, never, it was always like an actual range, right? Like, it sure. was usually, if you, if you were in the DFW area, yeah. you might remember the... And I'll show you my knife collection, too. Yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> I don't know. If you, I, I, I never had a problem. But right. also, what would often happen is, like, after that, they would like it. And she would be like, oh, man, I, I have this friend or this. I told this friend, and they want to go. And then suddenly, the next week, I'm bringing, like, nine, eight or nine people out. Yeah, I know like, it grows fast. Yeah. Um, and part of it is, number one, is not seeming super chutty about it, not talking about, like, you, you, we all know the kind of gun owners who like the thing they're going to, and this will do this to a person's body, or this, will, this is the weapon that this military unit uses, as opposed to like, you know, I think one of the things that has been most helpful when I've taken people out is before you get to the range, when there's no pressure on and there's no gunfire, taking the weapons out and walking through, this is how this action works, this is how yeah. you handle this one, this is how, these are how the, and letting them hold them in, a, in, a, in, a, in like a living room or something, a space that is completely comforting to them so that they're not both dealing with this is the first time I am holding an AR-15 and there's people shooting all around me in the yeah. center and I've got hearing protection in, right? Um, familiar, Allow them to familiarize themselves with the tool um, and walk them through. We recently did a Stop the Bleed course for some people mm -hmm. in uh, Portland and one of the things we did at the end of it that I was kind of an addition to the Stop the Bleed course is I took out an AR and I took out a semi-automatic handgun and I walked everyone through. And I, you know, the thing I said was like, hey, people are going to come at this from a variety. If you think these should be banned, you know, and I shouldn't be able to have these, that's totally fine. I have no desire to argue with you. There's 400 million of these in the United States. There are 276 million cars. <laughs> Every adult should understand the basics yeah. of how to render these weapons safe. So I'm going to walk you through. This is how to I'm gonna put like snap caps and masks. Sure. This is how to unload an AR-15 that is chambered. Uh, and, and including stuff like this is... You know, how to make sure the barrel doesn't point at anything. Right. You know, these are, again, things that you should... So we we're not just walking them through how to render a weapon safe, but also kind of stealthily. These are the very basics of gun handling, right? Um, and a lot of folks after that who were there wound up wanting to go do range training afterwards. And I think it was because, and one of the things that people brought up a few times was like, I've always been scared, sometimes, obviously, a lot of people are scared of guns. Anyone who is scared of guns is scared with very good reason. It's a very rational thing to be, oh, right? Yeah, it's, it's a lethal weapon. Um, yeah. And um, people appreciated having the chance to actually, again, hold one and understand how to manipulate one on a basic level without being pressured to shoot. And I think that actually is something, one way to potentially get people who... Number one, if you approach it as like, hey, I'm not trying to like convince you of my beliefs on the Second Amendment or on gun. I'm not trying to con to get you to buy a gun. But these are there's 400 million of these fucking things. That's just logic. You want to learn the how to unload one, Ooh. you know, in case something happens in the world. I think most people are going to be like, yeah, actually, I would like that. We can do it in the living room. There's not a lot of stress. So that that would be like one piece of advice I would have. And then when it comes to making the actual like arguments as to why I think the government should not have a monopoly on the use of force and why I don't believe that I I don't want to live in a place where the police uh, are have access to weapons that I do not uh, mm -hmm. and I'm not wild about the state having access <laughs> to weapons that I can't um, you know I, 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 I'll, I'll make I'll, I'll agree that like perhaps we shouldn't totally democratize the access to like service to air missiles although we'll see how that works for Ukraine yeah. <laughs> You know, it's it's funny when you mention this because when I, when you were saying that I have a, diff a little different answer, mine's a little darker, but I think that yours is a positive in, in, input on this because part of this is demystification. When it comes to people that are already like super gun people, yeah, there's one issue of mystification where they seem to think that it's some sort of magical totem, yeah, that will protect them against everything, yeah, and that's absolutely false. Yes, if you don't have training and skill and how to use these properly, they could be even more dangerous to you than not having one. Yeah, so it's not a, it's not a magic item there. And for people who are against them, or have been taught their whole lives to be afraid of them, it's also a mythologically dangerous thing yeah. that they've been told their whole lives is to be afraid of. Mm -hmm. And both of the solutions on both ends is education and demystification. Yep. And for those that are in the audience, this is Fennel, and this is her second time on InRange TV. And I kind of left the space between us because I figured she'd do this, actually. So she's here to visit. So everyone loves Fennel. Um, but my answer to this is a little bit darker because the question is how do we get more of these uh, folks into firearms culture and spaces and one I think is right absolutely like providing providing a space where the air hasn't been sucked out of the room for people of different views and identities to be in a place that feels safe that is safe one but I think the thing that's going to do it more than anything and I hate to say this and I think I'm seeing it already is, is fear Mm -hmm. um, and not fear, not fear of guns. No, but, but fear of the uh, fact that the reality is: yeah. you look at the news, 
or you look at the, of the world we're in right now, especially in the U.S., and you're like, if only those people have these. Yeah. The rest of us are kind of in trouble if yeah. we're not. This is potentially and, very bad. And we're yeah. probably not getting them to give them up. Yeah. So that's not, I don't mean fear is like a super bad thing, but fear no. can be a motivator sometimes to do, if and, you do it intelligently, a smart thing. And, and I think one of the things that's important when you are making that, having that, I don't even want to phrase it as an argument, mm. when you are trying to impart that to people, and, and this is something that I have a lot, of, that I think a lot of folks on the left still have been falling into. They're very frustrated with the way leftists who are pro-gun in social media, I've seen some of them act when we talk about gun control and when, you know, there's a mass shooting and there's a big push for more gun control. Of course. Get this kind of reflexive anti-liberal thing. And I think that one of the most important things to do, both from just an ethical standpoint and also from having a positive conversation about guns with people who are in that very anti-ban all state is... Mm -hmm recognize the fundamental rationality and ethical fairness of why they don't want there to be guns. They just watch as we all look like 20 fucking kids get shot to death. That's fucked up. We shouldn't live in a country where that is a thing that happens constantly. No, of course now, not. Right. I think I do not agree with them on the remedy to that, yes. obviously, but I, I don't think you, you don't start from this, oh, well, you're just a nanny state, or you start from, that's totally reasonable for you to hate these things. And a lot of people in history who have had to use firearms to defend themselves don't like those firearms. Some of the most effective soldiers in history are not people who ever picked up a gun again after they were didn't no longer had to use them, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we're in the situation that we're in. The danger is the danger that it is. This group of people are heavily armed and nothing is going to change that. So it is fundamentally a rational thing for you to want your people in your community to be capable of using weapons and to have them. Because that's the... And, and, and we can get into broader conversations about why I don't think it's ever a good idea for the state to have a total monopoly on the use of force. But I think it starts from this, I understand why you hate these things yeah. and why you're angry. And that's not irrational. And I'm not going to like act like you're somehow weaker than me because you don't like firearms. Because, again, one of the most reasonable things in the world is to not like weapons. Um, I also think it's perfectly reasonable to like weapons because we're kind of inherently wired to make and use them. Um, but it, I, I think it's important to, while disagreeing with people about that, while, while trying to kind of make a case contrary to some of their fundamental beliefs about the world, to acknowledge that they're not like coming at, they're not coming at wanting the guns to go away because they are somehow like bad people. They're reacting with horror in a situation that it's reasonable to react with horror in, but I don't think they've considered some of the things that I've considered about this, right? And that's kind of the way I try to, like, go with it. Maybe it's a combination of both. Maybe the kickstart has been the events that have been happening, which, of course, we, I think, all wish weren't the case. Mm -hmm. But that got people realizing, wow, this isn't really a choice. I need to do this. Yeah. But then as they start to use them, and as you use them, if you really become skilled with them, it's really hard to not be enamored with skill building and these, these tools. Yeah. And then you'll find that you'll make, bring other people along that maybe didn't initially jumpstart because of that. And I don't like the word fear, but response to the reality of the situation. Yeah. And during what you were doing, what you're saying, like bringing them out and then all of a sudden eight or nine more come. Yeah. You're like, oh, what, what, this isn't the thing I thought it was. Yeah. And, and that's, I mean, again, it's, it's, and there's also, there are some people that like, I have had conversations with folks who are like survivors of mass shootings where the, even at points will be like, look, I, am, I, I don't entirely disagree with the logic of some of what you're saying. Like, I just can't get on board with it. And like, yeah, of course not, right? Like, I'm not going to... And I, I guess I think one of the things I would like is to see is people without ceding the importance of being armed or ceding your belief in the importance uh, of a society in which access to tools that are capable of doing violence is not limited to agents of the state, which is something I believe uncompromisingly on. Um, understanding that people who disagree with you on that are, as often as not, there's certainly some fucking NIMBY types. There's a great example that I'll talk about in a second, um, who are coming at it from a shitty place, but they're not inherently, and you, you should, I think it, it is helpful, especially in terms of like getting people who are maybe not on one side or the other to not reject your arguments out of hand yep. to approach those people with compassion still, even though you may disagree very intensely with them. Now, I have come into recently, read, read an article 
about Portland. Obviously, Portland has a lot of houseless people, right? And there are a lot of people who hate those houseless people and have been doing shit like putting up these like big uh, planters filled with like rocks and shit in areas where folks were camping so, and saying that they're doing it to like put up like green the park. Beautifying the neighborhood. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They're putting up these, they're basically big like cow um, yeah. water troughs and stuff. They're like, anyway, there was this, so there's this neighborhood that has like a couple of vacant houses that houses people have been squatting in. Well, I guess they're not, they're, people have been squatting in. And there was like a story in some local Portland station about how scared the neighborhood was and about like how these people are like, we're sure they're stealing stuff and like this has happened and this has happened and we're all, you know, I don't feel safe in my neighborhood anymore. And there was a quote from one lady who was like, well, me and my husband are not pro-gun, but now we have one because of the, and I'm like, so number one, I'm going to guarantee you're going to vote to add more gun control to the state to make it harder for other people to acquire arms. Yeah. But when you got scared of a homeless person, you bought a fucking gun. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, um, that's ugly. So yeah, there's definitely some very frustrating, but that's not, anyway, whatever. I think we made the point. Yeah. So this one's just for me real quick. I'll just knock it out. Cal, uh, are you, Carl, going to DEFCON or Cornfield Brutality this year? Unfortunately, for myself and others, they're on the same weekend. And they are, and when we scheduled Cornfield Brutality, which is the next Brutality event with Brownells, I did not really realize that it was stepping on DEFCON. So in this regard, I need to do my in-range work, and I'm going to be at Cornfield Brutality and not DEFCON. Oh. Boo. We'll work on that next time. So, yes, I'll be at Cornfield. Ah, here we go. This one's... Ah, we talked about this a little bit. This is a good okay. one. Do you think we'll see more squad-based anti-drone equipment or weaponry, given the amount of Ukrainian footage that there is of drones being used to ambush unaware troops? So, anti-drone tech. We certainly are going to see more anti-drone tech. I don't know in terms of squad-based. So, I, I, have, I, have, I have, number one, been targeted by weaponized civilian drones in the past, and I have spent a lot of time talking to people who have, like, either attempted to or successfully shot them down. The Iraqi, it, when it comes to conventional weapons, the, the fucking Iraqi SWAT team guys I talked to who had shot down a couple said the only real thing they had success with was literally leaning back with a dashka in the air and just filling the sky with as many big-ass pieces of lead as possible near the source of light. It's like trying to shoot down a zero. Just put out so much lead exactly. that nothing exactly. can get through. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's a particularly effective way to deal with them. Uh, it does seem, because obviously... Prior to the Russian expanded invasion of Ukraine, there was a lot of discussion from people who were very knowledgeable at, at analyzing weaponry and, and, and kind of changing military tactics, who were looking at the Bayraktar, the, which is the Turkish drone that has been very effective in the early stages of this expanded fighting in Ukraine. We're like, this is not going to be an effective weapon against the Russian military because it's very easy to jam and it's very easy to take out with air defenses. Um, obviously it wound up being extremely effective early on because the Russian military was a shit show. <laughs> no effective actions to protect their troops. Um, it is one of the things that the people who've gotten super pro Bayraktar, and by the way, I am not pro the, the company that makes those because they've been used much longer than they've been used in Ukraine. They've been used to fuck with Armenians and fuck with uh, people in Rojava in northeast Syria, um, large, oftentimes killing civilians and uh, local activists rather than going after military targets. So fuck the Turkish military just like many other militaries. Um, not particularly more than the... Anyway, whatever. <laughs> um, but uh, the tracks. So the Bayraktar has been, after the first couple of weeks of the war, the Russians did start to adapt. And then the current phase when most of the fighting is in southeast and like the Donbass area, um, they have not been effective for a while. They've been at least markedly less. Because... The Russians got their supply lines more in order and and built and, and set up an order of battle that was better at effectively countering these. Their anti-air has gotten more effective. Um, and so one of the things you're seeing with the new HIMARS, these big long-range missiles that uh, Ukraine has received from the West, they've been using them to target command and control facilities and anti-aircraft. And I've seen some people saying that, like, well, we may see the Bayraktars be more useful again once they get Russian air defenses taken out. So I think one thing you're going to see is, number one, there are already a lot of effective anti-air, so one of the things I think we're going to see in fights where both sides have access to kind of modern weaponry is part of battle doctrine is going to be 
utilizing artillery to take out air defenses to allow drones to get in and do more targeted strikes. Which isn't any different than previous no, air war, right? It's, you would yeah. take out anti-aircraft yeah, so that your pilots could fly in and do the same thing. So these just don't have a pilot in them. These do not. And, yeah. and so where I think things have actually changed, and I, I, I don't think there is an effective counter to it yet, but, so the Bayraktar is functionally similar to like a Predator or something. It is a large military-grade drone, right? You could not build a Bayraktar in your garage, you know? Like, um, this wasn't brought to you by um, DJI. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, another thing you have seen was a shitload of hobbyists, most of whom were also veterans, right? Because Ukraine has an enormous veteran. Prior to the start of, of to the expansion of hostilities, had a massive veteran population, which was part of a really effective strategy by the Defense Department to rotate you know, troops through very rapid, anyway, whatever. Um, a lot of folks who bought DJIs and other civilian drones or just assembled some entirely from like 3D printed and otherwise home, home manufactured parts and used, rigged them with small bombs and thermal cameras and have been going out since the start of the war and doing night hunts where they will find camped out Russian soldiers and you'll drop a couple of small grenade sized bombs on a group of soldiers on like a platoon or something who are like setting up for the night or like eating food or whatnot. And that, number one, conventional air defenses are not... Not on that little thing. No, not right. on that little thing. And yeah, it's fucking terrible. It's effectively a little special forces unit that you can control with a fucking... And if one gets blown up, you've lost $800. It's extremely off, low risk like to the operator. Six guys who... There's almost no reason not to do this, exactly. right? Yeah. Extremely effective. There are certain countermeasures. There's those big gun-type things I'm sure everybody's seen. And, and the Myanmar military is using them, too, because rebels in Myanmar have also been weaponizing drones very effectively. Um, and it's fucking, it's General Alibaba in a lot of cases. I've had conversations with guys about this where they're like, yeah, we get everything we fucking need from Alibaba and the rest we 3D print. Um, and um, that, I, don't, I haven't seen, obviously it can be, there are different kind of jamming things you can get, but right. there's counters to that, right? Yeah, yeah. And then there's the guns you get, but like, that's moderately more effective than trying to shoot them down conventionally. But there's not a magic bullet yet. And that's the thing that I think is really a game changer. And not just the ability of these small weaponized drones to carry out, like, you know, hunter-killer missions, but the ability of those drones to provide intelligence for troops in the field to allow for more effective maneuvering and more effective ambush gates and stuff. Um, and I don't think anyone has effective an effective counter to that yet, really. I can't help but think that I know, not to bring up sci-fi, but the Terminator world, drone versus drone. Yeah. There's going to be drones that are anti-drone. Yeah, yeah. They're going to seek drones and then blow up, or yes. whatever they're going to do. Yeah. Yes, I think you... Or they'll have first person where you're literally going to have, like, it sounds corny, but, like, literally, like, dogfighting with drones. Like, that stuff's going to happen. Yeah. If it hasn't already. And it'll be, I don't know, yeah, it's interesting, because I don't know what the dogfighting will look like, because I kind of think one of the most effective things people might do is something like a switchblade drone, like a loitering mm -hmm. munition, mm -hmm. that is just built around a big, kind of like a frag, sh uh, or a flat shrapnel burst that has, you know, because there's different ways you can tell where there's something that's kind of emitting the radio signals a drone has, yep. and it seeks those out and then detonates, mm -hmm, right? Yeah. And like, to try to... So I, I'm sure there will be more, and I'm sure a lot of that's going to wind up being, for conventional militaries, man-portable. You're all, all, already seeing conventional militaries building in drone capacity to fire teams and squads, where you, you, you have a fucking drone guy yeah. in your squad. You got your backpack, you take yeah, it out. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So that that is certainly only going to become more or, I, I am when I, I have made the statement a couple of times, and I'm not the first person or the most qualified person to make this. That I think it's like I think drones are a maxim level, maxim gun level advancement in warfare. But I'm not talking about like the Predator or the Bayraktar. I'm talking about this shit. I'm talking about the thing a dude can have alongside the fucking spare boxes of LMG. These and little things, yeah, carrying. yeah. Um, that is a massive, massive force mul multiplier. You know, you've got a platoon of guys, and you give four, even just spotter drones to that platoon of guys. You have substantially increased their ability to gather intelligence and to, like, move and maneuver, you know, just by having those. On top of that, the other thing that, in, in regards to this, is um, when I was mentioning drone versus drone, but the, um, the, the reality of this is, like you said, there's low cost, there's no risk to using them. Yeah. Quite honestly. One thing I saw years ago, and I forgot who it was. They were training birds to take out drones. Yeah, I'm sure you're going like, to see like, more shit. Like, yeah, the hawks. Yeah. Like you send up the hawk, and it just flies yeah. around. It's like, oh, there's one. All I have to do is knock yeah. it off kilter. Right? No, like, they're not yeah. hard to fuck up yeah. once they're yeah. in here. It's just hard to find them. And yeah. I, I suspect maybe when people, if people get, like, 
find a repeatable way to train hawks. It must be possible because they're very trainable animals. Mm -hmm. That could actually wind up being... I wouldn't be surprised if at some point it's like, no, this works better than any of the mechanics. Just birds. People this reminds me of the old World War II birds. thing where they were trying to train dogs to take out tanks, but yeah. then when they deployed them, the dogs couldn't differentiate between Soviet and Nazi yeah, tanks. Yeah. And they just blew up every tank. So you send up a hawk, it's not right. going to know which drone to take out. It's just going to take out any drone. But maybe yeah. you could use birds to make it an anti-drone area. Yeah, you could right, just yeah. kind of like, yeah, that is interesting. And I don't know how. I mean, maybe... And birds, will, birds hate drones anyway, naturally. Yeah. If you fly a drone around and you're around a bird of prey, they will attack them. It's interesting. I they don't dig them. Because I think a lot of species of predator birds are smarter than dogs. I wonder if you'd be able to... Differentiate a drone from a yeah, drone? I, I've never trained a bird to do anything. Right, yeah. so I, I don't know. <laughs> I bet you could... I bet crows could figure it out, though. Like, maybe if you had... Maybe if you had drones that were marked up like your guys delivering like food and stuff to a nest of crows. You could teach them to defend certain drones and it's, I don't know. What do you do for your anti-drone program? Yeah. We use murder, a murder yeah. of crows. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it would be pretty cool as an army to like go into battle preceded by a swarm just, of crows. Just flying in? Yeah. Like this like blots yeah. out the sun? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'd be into that too. Ah, uh, this one's straight up for you. Um, can toast Kent's go okay? Some of these names are hard. What? K E N T S O K. Yeah, Kent's okay. Kent's okay. Is there anyone that you researched when you thought they would be a bathroom to find out they actually might have been a cool person? Or did something cool? Like you're like, this has got to be a shitbird. And then, oh. Huh. They cured cancer. Or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I actually, now that I can't remember who it was. Um. But yeah, there have been like a couple of folks that I I I thought were were much worse than they wound up being. Um, I'm trying to recall who it was because one of these happened recently, but now I'm blanking on the story, uh, which is probably not too great from a content perspective. Yes, it has. that has happened a couple of times. I'm not really recalling. I remember even when we talked about yeah. Maxim on, on the podcast. Yeah, he yeah. He actually did some cool stuff, too. He, he definitely like, did. Yeah. With well, the fucking, I mean, uh, he invented the inhaler. Yeah, right? that's yeah. really, that's a great there. Yeah, and there's a bunch of, like, I don't know, there's always, like, weird shit like that for, for especially the inventor kind of bastards and the, the medical bastards. You know, we did an episode that, that'll be dropping the week that you and I are recording this about the the, the guy who is generally viewed to be the founder of gynecology, who was, like, legitimately an excellent medical doctor. Um, he just was not an ethical medical doctor and learned a lot of things by experimenting on enslaved people in a horribly brutal fashion. But the thing, like, from a cap capability standpoint, he wasn't, like, a medical grifter. He right. understood what he was doing, and he it came up with new ways of treating things that people hadn't been able to do before. Um, and those are always interesting, because it's like... I actually think this is an area in which one of the things people are, do that's silly is talk about, like, German experiments in World War II and, like, the scientific value. Yeah. Most of that shit, nearly all of it was useless. No, no. Yeah. Like, the, there was nonsense they were doing. But the, the J. Marion Sims, that, that actually does pose, like, is more of an interesting case from an ethical standpoint because what he was doing was, without consent and experimenting on enslaved people in a horrible way, um, in order to solve what was a legitimately significant medical problem. So there are, there's still a doctor today, a very prominent one, who defends him. I think this guy is very wrong, and we go into detail about why I think he's wrong in the episode. But it is like, he has more of a leg to stand on than the guys who are like, well, but the, the dudes in Auschwitz who were doing experiments learned things. Like, well, they really did. <laughs> they really didn't learn much. Um, but yeah, I, I always, I don't know, whenever you get to like, people who ethics and medical experimentation that is interesting ethical ground because a lot of people who don't normally make the purely utilitarian argument that like well what matters is the net total of heat of, of suffering averted start to make that argument um and i don't know why it is but they wouldn't make it in other cases right mm -hmm. but for whatever reason when you're talking about Ex medical experimentation on people from the past. Folks are willing to overlook some really fucked up shit if something was like cured. Um, maybe I just find maybe because it helped them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Maybe I mean there isn't self-serving like, at all. Yeah, things, well, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. Let's see here. Um, this one's actually you kind of touched on this. Matisse E. 
What info can you find or provide about the gradual miniaturization of precision guided munitions? Or, for example, are there precision guided 81 millimeter mortar rounds or something like that, like bomblets? Or you were talking it, a little bit about some of this, yeah. There's certainly, like, if you, if you, because you, you can read, you know, those articles that'll come in every now and then about, like, the military's designed this, like, 20 millimeter grenade or something yep. that can, like, go around corners and shit. And, like, yeah, I, I can't think of any, like, it's definitely stuff that's in development and functionally. At this point, with miniature, miniaturization being where it is, there have been people who have miniaturized drones that are basically like 40 millimeter grenades with the ability to fly for like five or ten minutes, you know? Um, and I, so I, yeah, I, it, it certainly is happening. I don't, I'm not aware of any of it being particularly useful on the battlefield yet. I'm not aware of any guided small munitions. And that sounds more like a terrorist kind of thing. Like you set up that little yes. drone and all yes. it does is seek human form and detonate. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, it just does whatever it does. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Or and, and some people, some of the ones that were weaponized, one of the, the really cool things that was done with little drones, some of which were basically just like bombs with wings, um, they flew a bunch of them into a Russian airbase in Syria and detonated them around the planes. So I don't know if they even killed anybody. Just but destroyed, they, destroyed aircraft. Ex- yeah. Tens of millions of dollars, you know, with with Twenty grand in, in drone parts, which is cool. Um, but yeah, I'm sure like as miniaturization gets better and as like drone programming gets better, like you'll see more of that stuff. Again, I, I know we have, I know there's some stuff that exists. There's some like individual guided grenade rounds and stuff. I've never heard of any of it being really used. Like I think there's even some shit that the Mark 19 is supposed to be able to. That is like limited self guiding, but I'm not aware of it ever actually being used in combat. But we're going to see some weird stuff coming out of 3D printing space and all yeah. that. People are there's going to be stuff that we. I wouldn't be surprised if there's some of that shit gets figured out, and if it's something rather than being something you fire, it's like you take this little you know grenade sized drone out of a fucking backpack and you turn it on, and somebody marker lights a thing and it goes off after. Oh yeah, like I paint, can't paint the target. I, 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 there are probably people listening right now who, given enough time, could figure out how to do that with software that's on fucking GitHub yep. and three D printed parts. I don't doubt that at all. Yeah. All right. Here's a more social one. Question for both of us, Drew S. What is the most important thing I should be doing to make our world and society better? Um, finding other people to organize with and work with in order to do things that you think make society better, both on like a broad scale and in your immediate community. People ask a lot about like what are the best. I just did an, art, uh, an episode of my daily podcast. It could happen here with with the Elm Fork John Brown Gun Club. We've been doing some really cool actions in Dallas. Uh, defending reproductive rights and LGBT marches and stuff mm-hmm. in an area that is very hostile and doing it carrying guns and stuff. And I talked with them about, like, what? how do you recommend people start? They don't have, you know, this group of folks that they've been organizing with for years and stuff. And they're like, start food distribution, you know? Start up something like that where you're, give, where you're or get, collecting things people need and giving them to people. When you are doing that, you will meet other people who are interested in doing the same thing purely because they also want to help. And that's how you start to build a community of people who are both want to make things around them better by helping other people and want to organize with other folks to do it. Um, and I think that's kind of the seed of everything good that can happen. And then, of course, from there we get, I mean, you should also be looking at organizations that already exist in your community that you can help with and, and work with organizations that you know exist like on a state level or, or on a national level um, that are, are doing things you might want to support or just take as a model. Um, because I, I, I do think one of the big difficulties, and this is something anarchists run into as a problem, is anarchists are great at local movements and yep. local organizing. And it's often much harder to do state-level or, or national-level organizing, which kind of more centralized and hierarchical groups tend to dominate at. Um, which I don't think necessarily has to be the case, but often is. Well, the more people you aggregate, the more the yeah. small differences start to become big ones. Yeah, and, and so I, I think that um, both gathering together and getting used to organizing and doing shit that is useful and also cool, like, one of the things I think that's neat about the Elm Fork folks is that, like, they were, part of what they were kind of going for is, like, well, what if somebody was, you've got these, like, groups of chugs showing up outside of, like, LGBT brunches and stuff and, like, threatening people and yelling at them about taking away their rights. What if there was, like, 12 dudes there with AR-15s, like, 
yelling at them back and providing a physical barrier and like scaring the shit out of them wouldn't that be better than them feeling the impunity to threaten children um and the answer is yes and it's 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 pretty dope but that all started because you know those folks those those individuals had been organizing and gathering and doing stuff often that was much more basic than that earlier they built up a community they built up understanding and networks of like these are different people in these areas i remember a year or so ago when i first met them they were setting up gathering food and supplies to distribute to the houseless community during the snow apocalypse in dallas in 2021 um and it's, you know from stuff like that they built a, a network of like folks that they felt like they could trust and organize with and like trust to be competent and um were able to do more kind of ambitious things from there you know you're talking on the broad level, but the answer I was going to give is the same, which is mutual aid. Yeah. And mutual aid can take all sorts of incarnations, whether it's at an organizational level or helping out your neighbor across the street. Like, And those little things go a long way because you never know how they're going to reverberate. Yeah. And I think it was so... So much of American culture seems to be fixated with the survival of the fittest and the idea that this one thing that does the best is the example of what yeah. you want to be. And then... But then you take, like, Kropotkin, and you're more about mutual aid as the true example of evolution, because working together for a better benefit means that that's the evolution of a thing. Yeah. And I think that's such a better idea, and it's actually the reality when you look yeah. at it, because think people or whatever that work together always achieve more than an individual, except in the most rare circumstances. Yeah. So instead of looking for the rock star that one out of five zillion succeeds by themselves, why don't you look at the larger paradigm of when people work together, they do better as a whole? Yeah, and that's, um, I mean, it's, uh, among other things, like, number one, I think a lot of effectively res effective resistance in the 21st century boils down to fighting specialization and fighting atomization, right? And why do people get, like, atomized? Because we live in a society where everybody is, number one, expected to, like, focus on the one thing that is most economically productive um, and focus on it to the exclusion and focus on their own like success and well-being to the exclusion of the people around them, which is why you get people being like, "Oh, there's houseless folks squatting in my community. I should buy a I better gun. buy a gun." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think focusing on stuff like how can I help, how can I organize with other people to help, fights atomization, builds a community for yourself and for others. All of that is 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 fundamentally good for you, and is also an act of resistance against the thing that is the primary problem, which is this kind of deep, deep, bone-rooted selfishness that so drives our society that we're in the process of, like, killing the biosphere in order to maintain, like, 2,000 people's capacity to profit. And, like, you know, a much larger chunk of people's ability to, let's say, never have to hang out around other people when they want to transit inside of a city, right? Yeah. Like, you know, every, everything from... The fact that all of our societies are so, our, all of our cities are so based around cars, and I say this as a guy who loves to drive, yeah. um, to, uh, to, I mean, to be quite frank, to like why mass shooters do the stuff that they do. Those are all really the a, a, a kind of the worst example of what atomization and sort of selfishness breeds in people. This like inability to see the humanity in others, and also desire to like express your own pain by doing an act of unfathomable harm to strangers. Liz. Um, so, I don't know. I think the way you fight all of that is community and mutual aid, she said. Yeah. Nemo O. Uh, keep on call keep on keeping, Carl. Love your stuff. Thank you. Um, oh, that's our audio device. <laughs> okay, so what you didn't see is we had to pause because Fennel, who is also part goblin, decided to knock the audio equipment off the table throw it across the room, and then I knocked over my water. So uh, that is normal life with fennel. So that's just how it works. So I was going with this question next. Nemo O, which is for me. Keep on keeping, Carl. Love your stuff. Literally all of it. Thank you very much. I just got through enjoying your great guest appearance on It Could Happen Here. Yay! Ah, uh, yeah. And uh, and they're going to start listening to Robert now regularly, too. So this okay. works both ways, which is awesome. That's great. Um, but what Nemo wanted to know was what password manager I use and recommend. And maybe you've got an answer for this, too. I have been long... I, every one of these is controversial. So whatever password manager you pick, someone's going to tell you it's the wrong one. I'm just It is like flashlights, knives, password managers, no win. I'm on LastPass. I actually like LastPass. LastPass got acquired by the large corporation Citrix. Mm. 
but originally it was developed well, and um, I haven't seen them change anything in terms of their encryption solution and how it works in terms of key management, etc. So I'm still happy with it. I don't know if you have one, but that's mine. Like There's a number of them out there that are fine. Just do your research on them. But that's the one I'm on it. I was on it before the acquisition. I think it was Citrix. Um, and I'm still happy with it. Although there was some churn when they were acquired, which was, oh no, what's going to happen to this tool? Yeah. And it didn't seem to be borked up yet, yeah. at least. So, But someone out there is going to tell me why I'm wrong, and that's just how that works for any uh, password or encryption solution. I will tell people wrong about knives and, it's and, and flashlights well no I don't no know. no just knives Actually, just knives <laughs> I'm a CRKT guy yeah oh yeah those are nice yeah always yeah. let's see what we got here oh. e Rahia. Yeah. what is your favorite historical factor subject that sounds like a fake or a conspiracy theory but it's actually real I was a couple um, of these, frankly. But, yeah, the yeah. fact that there was a fascist conspiracy that included J.P. Morgan and George H.W. Bush's father to overthrow Franklin Delano Roosevelt and institute a dictatorship. Uh, That's a good one. That was only stopped because they attempted to get a, the most decorated soldier in the United States to be, like, their fascist figurehead, and he wound up being a pretty based guy named Smedley Butler. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um... That's a cool one that sounds like a conspiracy, but didn't. And then anything the CIA did in Africa or Latin America um, is generally like, sounds like a conspiracy theory, but they actually wrote extensively about what they, like the assassination of Patrice Lumumba being a, a great example. Mine's super mundane and not as exotic as that, but it's something that a lot of people are familiar with now, but the more I looked into and learned about MK Ultra, the more I'm like, what? That like, shit's wild. MK Ultra is like that. Does not sound like something that really happened, right? No, because they were yeah. just they were just wilding after a certain. Oh time. yeah. Like, what happens if we just pour a gallon yeah. of LSD into the pudding or whatever? Like it was like not exactly, but I'm yeah. exaggerating. But stuff like that, just dosing people with no warning, finding out what happens, and then there was a lot of stuff going on at the time, which I'm not going to be conspiratorial and minded. But when you look at the period of time when MK Ultra was at its like zenith. You're also looking at, like, when Manson was doing his thing and all that stuff. I'm not saying they're tied. not saying that. But it's just a lot of stuff going on at once. Yeah, there's a lot of, um, I don't know. That we, like, there's, I, sometimes we will post, like, the conspiracy theory iceberg where it goes from, like, conspiracy theories that, that are, like, pretty based in, like, reasonable stuff. Um, like Epstein, you know, the, the Epstein suicide conspiracy yeah. theories and stuff where it's like, okay, no, that's, it's absolutely reasonable to look at this guy who was sex trafficking you know, underage people to the wealthiest folks in society and be like, well, maybe that wasn't a legitimate suicide. Right? Like, <laughs> that's not an irrational... Uh, maybe. Then, you know, so that's like at the biggest level of the, of the, of the iceberg, where it's, it, where it's stuff like, yeah, maybe some of the fucked up shit that was going on in the 60s had something to do with MK Ultra, and we're not like... It's not completely off the hook to right? think that, yeah. And then at the very top, it's, you know... Um, I don't know. Lee Harvey Oswald killed JFK. Like, nonsense like that. Oh, you don't think he did? Well, it's Bernard Sanders. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Fair. Let's go back to a gun question. Mm -hmm. uh, Travis W. I recently discovered there was a whole community online devoted to making their own black powder. Well, that's not surprising, considering the technology is as old as it is, right? I mean, yeah, and I knew that. a song in 1776 about how to make your own black powder. Now, I know you mostly use black powder alternatives. Actually, that's not true. I use real black powder more than I don't. I use it when I have to. But, uh, but I was curious, have you ever tried making your own black powder just to experiment with making it? And no, I do have all my fingers. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying you can't, but I haven't had a need to. Yeah. And it's like, there's the gee whiz element of, do I want to learn how to do this? And really, it's just three components Yeah. in the right ratio. But then you've got to grind it and get it to the right consistency and all that. It's probably fine. I know there's a process where you have to wet it and then dry it yeah. and you dry it in your oven. It's just uh, there's a bit of uh, to me. But I've never tried it, but I haven't had to. Yeah, I can see why you'd want to just have the experience. Even like I, There was a period of time where I, like as a kid, learned how to like light a fire using friction and stuff. Sure. And I don't particularly want to get do that again because it's a giant pain in the ass and I ha I happen to think any situation in which I'm likely to need it I'm already fucked yeah. um, but it was nice to like have that experience and I could see if I had a lot more time on my hands wanting to like I just want to know that I know how to do it you know um, but also the odds because it's something where the consequence of getting it wrong is blowing yourself up which is very different for friction mm -hmm. fire 
I probably never will try. Yeah. I, but I get why people are intrigued by there's it. There's a gee whiz element to this that yeah. I've kind of always wondered about. And I'm not going to say I would never do it. Because I, I am that person yeah. at some point. But I just haven't had the need. I've been able to acquire it without issue. It's not hard to get access to gunpowder in the United well, States. No. Well, black powder is more regulated than regular gunpowder quite a bit. No. It's, yeah, because it's, it's actually classified as an explosive. Oh, interesting. So yeah. that, okay. Yeah. So regular gunpowder is an accelerant, and black powder is an explosive. And that's why the alternatives exist, like 777 and Pyrodex, because of their burn rate and how they combust, they're considered an accelerant versus an explosive. Oh, interesting. But actual black powder, black powder is regulated as an explosive. I'm revealing myself as a guy who does not shoot very much black powder. Uh, clearly. No, that's yeah. fine. No, people, most people don't realize that. So, but black powder is not hard to acquire because you go online to a certain number of vendors when it's in stock. There's been a there was a panic attack recently because the U.S. manufacturer of black powder, GoX, put themselves up for sale and wasn't producing any further, and that, that was the one that made it in the U.S. I don't know what the status of it is right now, but there was then, of all the things I thought there wasn't going to be a run on in firearms, like we couldn't, you couldn't get 5.56, five, you couldn't get 9mm. Okay. I'm like, black powder's going to be full. No, that became a problem too. Oh. And uh, all of a sudden, all the black powder was sold out, all the percussion caps were sold out, like all this stuff from 1865, right? Okay. And, um, but... Uh, and at that point, you're like, well, it would be interesting to make this stuff. But really, even when that happened, it wasn't that hard. You go to a couple of different vendors online. You provide, you do have to provide them your ID to prove proof of age and residency. But you can have, like, a lot of this to ship to your house. See, Carl, I mean, this panic is one more reason why, as I've been telling you, you should convert all of your black powder arms to the one kind of munition that's always in stock, 40 Smith & Wesson. Oh, that's true. 40 is always in yeah. stock. But yeah. <laughs> you can always get 40, and you can always pull the bullets and dump the powder. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> that's true. Nobody wants the 40. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. Um, oh, this is, I don't even know, this is a weird postul postulating. Robin V, how will the Russian-Ukrainian war end, in your opinion? I mean, that's a big quote. I mean, there's there's so many of it, like, because I'm not one of those people who thinks that it's particularly likely that Putin's going to go all nukes, even if this shit goes completely pear-shaped for him, but it's certainly not a 0% chance, sure. right? He has the capacity, and he's got the power to do it, um, and it's not something I would take off the tail, table as possible. At the moment, I suspect there will be a negotiated peace that probably ends with more or less the separatist territories that were in Russian hands at the start of the war remaining in their hands, but probably not a ton more. I mean, it kind of depends. Everything's changing. Like, right, like a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, things were looking a lot rougher for the Ukrainians, and there's still the casualties that have been suffering in the Donbass from nightmares. A lot of units were working 50 to 80% losses. Um, but since the arrival of the, the HIMARS systems, and there's been other long-range artillery that's been coming in from the West, it seems like that shifted again, and you're getting some really nightmare reports from the Russian side of, like, how devastating that, because they don't have any kind of counter-battery options for it. Fires, none of their field artillery can hit that shit at the distance of shooting from. They're not reliably able to take, you know, get go after it with air power. And um, none of their, all of their, their, like, S-300 and stuff were supposed to be able to deal with that kind of stuff on paper, but as is often the case, have not proven able to deal with it. And um, it seems to be, because you've, at least as we're doing this right now, the last I heard, is you've got Ukrainian troops who are making advances on Kherson and Mariupol again. Um, again, very hard to say what's going to happen. This is like, but I, my, my suspicion is that at some point, there will be a negotiated peace where some chunk of the Donbass region, probably broadly analogous to what was in separatist hands at the start of the war, more or less remains in Russian hands, and there's a negotiated peace for everything else. Um, that's my suspicion, because there's, there's certainly going to be a point where Ukraine has retaken enough of their territory that what they're looking at is stuff that has been out of their control for quite a while, mostly, and they're like, how much... How many more Why lives? waste resources on yeah, that? How further? many more lives yeah. are we willing to really expend for this? Um, I don't think it's particularly likely that you're going to see Ukraine retake Crimea. And I, 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 I'm not a Russia expert. I'm very far from a Russia expert. And the Russia experts I talk to, though, and and the people I know who are experts on the country, 
do not seem to think that the Putin regime is an immediate risk of falling. So I, I don't think we're going to see a situation where just the regime collapses and the war effort collapses as a result of that. It just, but also it's, it, it is, there's not great information available. I found that interesting because, I mean, at the beginning of all this, when like, where the Russian economy fell apart and all of that happened and all of the things that happened sanction-wise, etc., yeah. one would have thought that like the oligarchs would have done something against this like rogue maniac that was destroying their financial futures, right? But it doesn't seem to be happening. I don't know that it would be fair to call him a rogue maniac who's destroying their fight. He certainly damaged certain aspects of it, but they also have the positions they have because of him, right? You don't mm, have... I that's mean, fair. Again, I'm, I, don't, I don't want to like get too much into this because I'm just not... Yeah, not well, nor am I. I'm just like... Um, no. But he... One of the, Putin is not incompetent. He's not a military leader of particular competence. But he is a very effective gambler who, up until very recently, had done some pretty big gambles and won big. Which is why um, this is happening, because the retribution for his yeah, actions really didn't come. It did not. Yeah. And it was also, I think what's been lost in how, what a clusterfuck the invasion was, for, which is some of the, some, some of the biggest fuck-ups in modern military history happened in the early stages of the invasion on the Russian side of things. Um was how methodical a lot of the buildup for this was in terms of just like how they were testing weapon systems and unit tactics and blooding special forces units in Syria and Libya for years. Um, there was a lot of, and, and, and you know, in, in actions in Ukraine and what they did in Georgia, there was a lot of like very methodical buildup to this that was not reckless. Um, I think the main reason people are calling it reckless is because it wound up being a disaster. Um, but I think, I think one of the mistakes people make a lot is focusing too much on the fuck-ups on the Russian side from a command and control perspective, mm -hmm. from, from just the, the, the bad decisions that were made by Putin and by people who he put in, into place commanding the military, and not enough on the major reasons why it was such a disaster, which has a lot to do with really fucking smart decisions that the Ukrainians made. Um, and I actually think that kind of does a disservice to how very intelligently they responded. If you don't, if you weren't because I started, this was the first thing I ever reported on as a conflict journalist. It was the, it was the Maidan Revolution, mm -hmm. actually. And then in 2015, I was in the Donbass region in a place called Divka, primarily, um, reporting on the fighting. But, um, and again, not an expert on this, but in 2014, the Ukrainian military got fucking housed. Um, there were some, nice, some stuff that looks very much like what you saw happen to the Russians in the last couple of weeks, where you would just have these armored units all bunched together, just getting massacred by artillery and stuff. Um, just It was an absolute debacle for, for them at every single level. And in the wake of that fucking disaster, they cleaned house from a lot of the corrupt oligarch-era leaders who had been in charge, right? Um, and they did a lot of really smart shit, including focusing on having this kind of like, not uh, like having this basically like National Guard program where normal people come in and serve for a short time and for, be rotated to the Donbass to get combat experience. Yeah. Sure. Because the goal was we want to have as many people that we could call up as reservists who have been in combat. That know what they're truly doing. And, and yeah. as a result, built those battle-hardened military in, 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 in Europe. Um, and I think, so I do think that there's a tendency to look at, like, the, the fuck-ups of the Russian military and how badly the invasion went and pin that on Putin, and there's a lot of blame to go on Putin, but I also think the primary thing that he fucked up in doing was not recognizing how intelligently the Ukrainians has... Undervaluing the Ukrainian exactly. effort, yeah. And, and, their pri and what they had done in response to his prior aggression, which is primarily why they're still in the fight, you know, because they made a lot of really good decisions. I wonder, I questioned on a longer one, but like, not to keep going on this one question, but I remember when this all started, of course, everywhere you'd go, there was like, stand with Ukraine, we stand with Ukraine, yeah. Ukraine flags, all this, all the normal social media slacktivism. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and media slacktivism. And that's kind of going off, and like, I'm kind of like, the fact I took this question was because I don't hear anybody talking about this anymore. Yeah. I find that really disturbing, actually. It's what happens with every war. Yeah, it's like, and right. so my fear about this, you, you know more than I do, so I don't really have a really relevant thing to say besides my fear was, we just, like, it just peters out, everyone forgets about it, They the Russians kind of get away with it, for lack of a better term, because external support diminishes, because the call for it diminishes, 
And it's just like this like flash in the pan. Oh yeah, that war that happened in Ukraine kind we'll of thing. Let's see. I'm not saying it's gonna happen, but yeah. they, with the general like that's certainly the bet Putin is making. Yes, and that's the which is also what's historically yeah. happened for him, really. Which is what happened. It's it's never the conflicts never got this big though. No. Deal with. And so one of the things that one of the reasons I think that's maybe less likely is number one, um, if you can make continuing to arm a country like it, there's a financial aspect to this. It's great business for a lot of people in the U.S. that we are <laughs> we are sending so many weapons to Ukraine. Yeah. So number one. That pressure is going to exist. Now, I think it's possible that 2024, you wind up having people on the right campaigning because Joe Biden is very much for arming Ukraine campaigning and, like, ending that. And maybe that'll be a factor. But you also have to think, like, the rest of NATO is involved in this. And, like, in Europe, it is a larger continuing story. And, a, and an increasing number of weapons are coming into Ukraine from other European countries. Um, so, I don't know. I, I mean, it's entirely possible... Putin will win this in the end. He's he's making a long bet that the West won't have the stomach to help. But also, this has not been a high expense military aid endeavor from the United States. If you look, if you compare prior to what's going on in Ukraine, the most successful uh, U.S. military intervention in a foreign country in our lifetimes was U.S. military support to Northeast Syria to Russia, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, now you have something else that is approaching that level, and with much less, because you had U.S. troops die in that fighting, fighting against ISIS in northern Syria. That's not going to happen. I, I do not foresee the United States sending ground troops into fucking Ukraine. Um, so it's pretty low. It just costs money. Um, money which winds up making a lot of people who are influential in Washington richer, so they're fine with it. And you're not hearing stories about Americans getting fucking murked in, you know, Kherson or whatever. Right. Um, so I, I don't know. It may have hit the point where it's not on the front burner in the news. It's definitely hit that point where it's not on the front burner in the news anymore. But it also may have hit a point where it's just accepted in the same way Afghanistan was, that like, oh, this is a thing where we're now sending treasure and, and bullets. The new um, perpetual war. But without every now and then hearing a story of, like, nine guys die in a car bombing. Right. Or our guys, right? Obviously, shitloads of people are dying. But I'm not referring to this from a moral standpoint. Right, right. from, like, U.S. support for, for it maintaining. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, uh, but at the moment, I, I do think probably the most likely end is some sort of negotiated peace. I don't think Russia's going to wind up taking a lot of territory uh, as a result of that. Hmm. All right, final question. Mickey Mauser, what's a hot take or hill to die on that you will take when it comes to a controversial or terrible person in history? Oh, so controversial slash terrible could be either, right? So it doesn't have to be a bad person. Hmm. Mine is not important, but I know what it is immediately. Okay. And I've answered this before, sort of. For me, two of them. One, Wyatt Earp sucked, and Billy the Kid was actually a good guy fighting against corrupt corporate and government interests. Okay. And those are both counter to the general Old West narrative. Yeah. Wider was the good cop doing a vigilante thing to defend his brothers and his family and take care of, of trash. But I think that he was also a vigilante that was doing extrajudicial justice that was also a criminal. Yeah. And Billy the Kid, while he was a criminal, was a criminal because the corporations in New Mexico under that uh, was aligned with not only the military but the government for corporate re- uh, for corrupt reasons, yeah, and he they ended up killing friends of his, and he took away to war, right? So I see him as a freedom fighter, actually, against corporate and corrupt government interests. Yeah. So those two, I'm willing to die on. Um, I guess I'm pretty pro Pancho Villa. Okay. Yeah. Um, Did a couple mistakes here and there, but yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, no, well, any war is like right? that. Yeah. Any war is going to have yeah. some fuck, but um, yeah. uh, broadly speaking, I don't think he was like the worst guy in that whole conflict. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think if you look at the things he did that were fucked up, like, yeah, there's some, like, things I won't personally defend, but name a U.S. general you think was a good dude. <laughs> <laughs> and I will, I, will, I will walk you through how they were responsible for more civilian deaths. Do you think um, that Pancho Villa would be viewed differently if he hadn't gone after Columbus, New Mexico? Yeah. Oh, like, if he had never done that, that, was a, that he was, would be seen as, like, a positive revolutionary. It would the be, fact that he came to the U.S. and mowed down some people... Which is terrible. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. Bad. I have a video yeah. on the channel about it. Yes. Uh, yeah. That, I think, is what solidified the yes. U.S. Yes. hatred for him. Yes. Yes. Okay. For sure. Yeah. Um, 
Because that turns turns him into a fucking demon, and then you get right. old Black Jack Pershing gets to... Anyway. And what he did in Columbus was not great. It was not good. No, no, no. 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 But it, it's also well within the kind of... It, 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 it's not, it was not an escalation of the kind of shit the United States had been doing. You know? Fair. Like, no, true. I mean, we could talk yeah. about, like, what Woodrow Wilson did to Vera Cruz. Right, right, yeah, right, yeah. Right, yeah. Um, but... Anyway, whatever. Um, and I, I guess, uh, um, I don't know who else? I had another name in my head. Um, um, oh, uh, fuck. It's right on the tip of my fucking... I'll throw one more out while you're trying okay. to remember. Okay. When it comes to the founding fathers, a lot of the ones that are revered the way they are, I'm like, ooh, mm-hmm. not so much. Ben Franklin was kind of an interesting, cool dude. I like Ben Franklin. Yeah. I like Ben Franklin... In part because of the, the 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 moral journey that he went mm-hmm. on, his attitudes, like why he became an abolitionist, is yep. a really interesting and kind of moving story. Um, and I, I'll, I'm a longtime defender of Thomas Paine. Yeah, oh yeah. Thomas Paine was was uh, a consistently pretty based dude, um, and I, I kind of think, yeah, if you're, I, I don't think I don't know. This is a, a, a deeper conversation that we can have, but like. There's a tactical case for not entirely ceding um, the fight over, like, Americana to the right. What? And I think maybe one of the thing, ways to do that is to talk about founding fathers that are known to everybody, but their actual politics are not known to everybody. Thomas Paine was an anti-Christian like Christian, uh, uh, political crusader who wrote an entire book about his issues with Christianity and the way it is politicized, and the way it's used to justify oppression. Um, way and, early on. Huh? Way early on. Very early yeah. on. And um, is also, the right has a strong affinity for Thomas Paine because they know, like, half of a thing about him. I right? remember when Glenn Beck would, like, put out his, like, comments, he, he, he like, put out an edition of comments. And I, if, to, if Thomas Paine, if you could bring Thomas Paine into, like, the modern era in a time machine and explain to him what Glenn Beck did with his book, mm-hmm. the first thing he would ask you was where he could get a gun. Because, yes. like, he <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, I like... I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Thomas Paine defender, more or less. Yeah. Well, even when you talk about that, it makes me think of one other one, of course, is, uh, is, uh, is Jefferson. Oh, who, who, who wrote yeah. really great stuff on paper, right? And then you look at him and his actions yeah, as a person, uh, and he was a... Fucking nightmare, right? Well, I mean, he, yeah. He was aware. That's the thing. He He's like, wow, of the I am terrible. People yeah. like me should not be allowed yeah. to do this. I will write this here, yeah. and maybe it'll happen later. Yeah. <laughs> that's what it felt like. I yeah. Mean, I, I mean, I'm not saying that's exactly it, he, because he was writing this with the idea of white men that held land. Yeah. Right? But I mean, when you read the writing outside of that context or take it out of that context, it reads like this liberation of the human yeah. spirit. He, he, was, he was aware, I think, on some level that in the same way that, like, well, I don't, I don't even want to make that comparison. But I, I think he knew at a certain level that, like, what he was doing wasn't justifiable. But it was also like a, a, he, it, it allowed him a life that he found pleasant. Well, well, Washington was like that too. He's like, you know what? After I die, let all the slaves go. But wait till I'm dead. Yeah. Like, <laughs> okay. Great. Yeah. You know who I will defend, yes. who's often a historic ruthless bastard, is uh, is Julius Caesar. I'm a, I'm, oh. I'm, I'm I'm reasonably, I think he, I think it would have been interesting to see how things would have actually played out if um, if he hadn't been assassinated. Because I'm not sure that he would have established the government that wound up following. Because he was also among the things that he was as much of a centralizer of power as Caesar was. He was also very anti oligarch and recognized kind of some fatal problems that the wealthy aristocracy in Rome had caused that yeah. were parts of the problems that wound up bringing the empire to its doom a few centuries later. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not anti-Julius Caesar. Um, he, he was, uh, he was an interesting fellow. I don't think he's, um, I think he, I think he, he kind of, I think he's probably a better person than Napoleon. Um, but, but they, they had some like similarities where, if you actually like look at some of the things they said and were trying to do, they're not people. They're not like a. They're not like. Um, they're, they're not like Hitler or somebody like that, where it's just be, oh, you were, you had these kind of like monstrous, purely monstrous reasons for centralizing power. Um, Caesar was a guy who, among other things, was reacting to things that were really fucked up about the system that he was in. Um, it's just that you know he also had some 
personal tyrannical aspects to him too. But I, I, I don't think uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe if they hadn't murdered him, we wouldn't have wound up with fucking Octavian, um, which wouldn't have been the worst thing in the world. So, first of all, I want to thank you for being here to be part of this today. Yeah. And for coming out to visit. And we're going to go do some shooting? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. A whole bunch of shooting, actually. Yes. And for anyone in the audience that isn't aware of your work, they should be. Behind the Bastards, it yeah, could happen right. here. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a novel called After the Revolution. Mm-hmm. You can find it on akpress.com. Uh, if you just Google AK, AK Press After the Revolution, it'll tell you where to find it at a small bookstore near you. Yeah. And that's the best way to support your work, is to consume the podcast and buy your books. Yeah, buy the book. Consume it. You can also find the book for free at atrbook.com. It's also the text is available for free, and the audio is available for free. It's a podcast. Uh, if you just type after the revolution into a podcast thing, but if you want a copy of the book and want to support both a small publisher and uh, indie bookstores, you can also do that. Cool. Yeah. And I've appreciated all our collaborations, and I hope we do yeah, more of them. Absolutely. Like here we are in person doing it now, right? Yeah. And the best way to support In Range is patreoncom slash TV. No advertisers, no corporate overlords, just you, the viewer. Thanks for watching.